In this video, we'll be working on this L322 Range Rover. It's a first generation L322, which in the US means it's an 03 to 05. What's the problem? Fuel starvation. Shown textbook science going up a hill, lurches, hesitates under extreme conditions that might even stall, give you an engine light, fault codes for fuel starvation in bank one, bank two. First thing you want to check, of course, are your vacuum lines for a couple of reasons. Vehicle this old could easily have a cracked vacuum. If you don't have a good vacuum, you're not going to get good fuel pressure because these vehicles have vacuum operated fuel pressure regulators. So the second thing you want to check is your fuel filter. Now, turns out the fuel filters on these cars are the fuel pressure regulator. You have a vacuum lead here and as it senses the vacuum from a running engine, it regulates the fuel pressure. If you don't have a good vacuum, you're not going to get good pressure. This was the original factory fuel filter, so that's on me. I should have replaced it a long time ago. Really, you don't want to let these go more than 50, 60,000 miles. So of course it was clogged and replacing it solved 80% of the drivability issues, but under extreme conditions like highway speed going up a hill, it would lose a little bit of power, couldn't pass. It was definitely starting to show performance issues. The pump was going bad. No complaints, 20 years for a pump, that's not bad at all. One of the design objectives of this car was to maximize ground clearance. They wanted to give it the best possible off-road performance. Now to do that, you have to have the drive line as high off the ground as possible, which means your fuel tank has to straddle that drive line column. So under a lot of conditions, that's like having two fuel tanks. So like most vehicles on the passenger side, and again, the two access hatches for this fuel tank are under the rear seat. You have a standard fuel pump and it's got a level sensor. This feeds the gauge that's on your dash. And on the driver's side, you have a secondary siphon that plugs into that main pump. That siphon sits under the driver, has a fuel level sensor that tells it when it needs to equalize the two sides of the tank. One of the things I wanna say, you're working with raw gas. I know you guys are gonna be careful, but if you don't have fire suppression, at least a good fire extinguisher, don't do this job. Also ventilation, you're gonna be breathing gasoline fumes. Try to work in a well-ventilated area, better for your health. And I just wanna make a note on trim. Getting the carpet off of those access hatches means you have to remove a little bit of trim. It's like half the job. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. Make sure you don't break anything when you're doing the job. Okay, let's get started. Now, when I still had performance issues after replacing the fuel filter, I decided to check the fuel pressure at the rail. And you'll notice here with the engine running, it's just below 40. And if I do a slight rev, it drops into the 30s. And that's well below the 50 PSI that you need to run these engines correctly. But notice when I turn the engine off, it, there's still pressure in the fuel system. And you'll never get the connectors off of the fuel pump when there's pressure in the system. So you're going to need to relieve that pressure. You can just use a standard little inflator like I've got here. Just put it in a bottle. Once you plug it onto the rail, it will relieve the pressure in the system. And that's going to make it a lot easier to disconnect your uh, fittings off the pump. Also disconnect the battery, number of reasons. It's a little bit safer and you'll reduce the chance of confusing the ECU while you're replacing the pump. When buying a new pump, you got a couple of options. You can buy just the pump only, like shown in the upper right, and you can pull apart your assembly and put the pump in, or you can buy a complete assembly like this. Either way, you wanna get a good brand from a good vendor who's got a warranty, because what happens on the assemblies like this is sometimes the electronics on these level sensors can be a little bit off, and if the ECU doesn't like the voltages it's getting from the pump, it will cut power to the pump and you'll be very unhappy about that. So try to buy a good quality one. Now, if you have a sudden complete loss of fuel pressure, then you may want to check your fuel pump relay right here on the bottom right. These two are the same. You can swap them. There's also a fuse and another one in the glove box. Since that's not the case, we need to get under the back seat to the access hatches. You got a fuel pump on this side and over on the driver's side, there's going to be another hatch. That's going to be your secondary siphon. So this trim has to come off. This upper one has to come off because there's a couple of bolts hidden here. This carpet trim has to come off. It's just easier to pull the floor piece off. These two seat latch bars have to come off and there's also a couple of spare tire straps that have to come off. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on all that. You'll notice with the seat belt trim that I'm pulling off, there's just a couple of little friction tabs on top, tucks in on the bottom. I'll give you a close up here. You didn't break anything. These are the tabs on top. Now what was hiding is the two bolts that hold this piece on. There's a couple of little bolts here you have to pull off with eight millimeter heads. And let's use our trim removal to pull this floor piece out. You're gonna see this trim removal piece again. These just snap right on. 
super easy so don't worry about it we'll put that back on when we're done this will snap off but because we haven't removed the upper trim piece yet we're gonna have to do that now so we pull this seat belt trim off that's going to reveal these two bolts. These have eight millimeter heads. Once you pull those off, you can lift this corner trim piece off. And what you'll see down below is the trim piece has a little dowel that plugs into that carpet trim. So once we lift that off, we can remove the carpet trim as well. And you're going to need to do that on both sides. Over on the passenger side, same thing. We've got this corner piece with the dowel removed. And we're going to pull the floor piece off. Then we'll pull the carpet trim off. Just got a couple of little friction tabs holding it in place. And now we can remove our jack. And then the spare tire strap, they just have little hex bolts holding them in place. We're going to remove both of those. And now the seat latch bars come out and those have Torx heads on them. And once you get those removed, now we're ready to untuck the carpet. Don't worry about these little black plastic discs. They stay on the carpet and it just untucks on both sides and you can lift it up. And now that the carpet's free to lift up, what we're going to do is we're going to strap it to the headrests on the front seats. You can use any kind of cord. I use bungees. It worked fine. And once you've got the carpet strapped up out of the way, I have a little flex wrench. It really helped to get the 10 millimeter nuts that are holding the access hatch covers down. I'll speed through this to save you guys some time and you'll be able to lift up the access hatches. And now that we lift it up, we can see we've got the top of the fuel pump. There's a little electrical connector with a bayonet. Just slide that to the left and you'll be able to lift the plug off of the fuel pump. And there's two fuel connectors in there. Before I do anything, I like to spray those with a lot of lubrication. This is not penetrating oil. I don't want to damage any of the O-rings. I just want to loosen up the connections. And for the lock rings, they're metal and I'm using WD-40 as a release just to make it a little bit more user friendly. Spray both of the ring nuts with the WD-40. And then I let it sit for a little while. And those ring nuts are pretty strong. They're metal. So you can come in with a screwdriver and a hammer and you can just tap those loose. Don't be shy. They'll come loose. And then you'll need to do the same with the lock ring on the driver's side to release the hatch for the secondary siphon. And now for the fuel connectors. And this is so important. You want to reach down, wiggle those things, make sure that they can move. That means the fuel pressure is released. And now we're going to use that trim removal tool again. It's two steps. First, you grab the fuel connector. You push it down very hard toward the pump. While you're pushing it down, then you want to use the trim tool to get under the red clip and lift it up and again that's while you're pushing it down and that should release the connector and we'll do the same thing on the second connector and once both connectors are removed tuck those two connectors off to the side keep them out of harm's way so they don't get damaged and with both the connectors off, you're now going to have some fuel that pooled on top of the fuel pump. And I'm just going to use a rag to get some of that off. It'll reduce the amount of spillage you have later when you pull the pump out. And now I'll give you a close-up view of the existing driver's side siphon. You can see the bottom of it is just snapped into the bottom of the tank. The top, the spring plunger is snapped into the top. And you can see the two fuel lines headed over to the fuel pump. And here's how the new fuel pump is going to go into the tank. The bottom of it, there's just a little cradle on the bottom of the tank. Tank. You just hook it into that and then the two springs hold it in place. The same with the siphon. It snaps into the bottom of the tank and then this spring plunger just snaps into the top of the tank and holds it in place. Sounds easy, right? Well, believe me, removing it is a lot easier than putting the new one back in. Oh yeah, my dive watch. It's not supposed to be diving in gasoline. I'll pop this uh, existing siphon out. It's pretty easy to unsnap. So you can see I've got it loose here. And now what I'm doing is I'm disconnecting the siphon hose from the fuel pump. And I'll give you a better close-up view of how that works in a minute. Once you've got that off, the pump's free to pull out. I've got a bucket I'm going to put it in so it doesn't make too much of a mess. And this is how the siphon hose attaches to the fuel pump. You can see with my right hand, I'm holding the release away so that I can plug the hose on and off the fuel pump. It's a little trickier reaching in with a screwdriver, but you'll get it. And now for the really fun part. So I'm going to go ahead and put the new siphon in and I'm going to hook the bottom of it into the slot on the bottom of the tank. And then I'm going to use the spring plunger to snap it into the top of the tank. 
And while I'm in there, I'm gonna push the two lines over toward the fuel pump. So now I'll take you in for a close up of the new siphon in place. You can see it's plugged into the bottom of the tank with the spring plunger holding it in place. And the two lines now, if we go over to the pump side, you can see they're just sitting there waiting for us to grab. And if you look at the fuel pump hatch, you'll see right now that the two siphon hoses are sitting on the outside. I was hoping I could slide the pump in part way, plug the lines in, and then finish putting it in. There's no way to get the pump in the hatch with those two lines on the outside. So the lines have to go on the inside while you begin lowering the pump into the hatch. Then you have to connect the siphon lines to the pump through the hatch. So unfortunately, you're going to have to reach into the hatch to connect the siphon hose to the new pump. And these are the long reach needle nose pliers that I used to get the job done and it did work. But when you're plugging that siphon hose onto the pump, it's got these little channels on the bottom that have to match up. And because you're reaching through the hatch opening, it's a little bit bit tricky but this is how I've managed to get it to work and although it looks a little bit easy like this remember the size of the hatch opening is fairly small that you're reaching through with the pliers. Now each of the hatch openings has a round rubber seal and you want to have that in place before you try putting anything in and in this case I'm putting a light coat of grease on the rim of the pump so it'll slide into place more easily. Once the bottom of the pump is correctly latched into the bottom of the tank you can just push it down and you'll need to hold down that spring pressure to hold the top of the pump down while you start the ring nut by hand. And once you get it snugged down by hand, then you can re-tighten it with the screwdriver the same way you took it off. And now with the battery reconnected, I'm going to turn the ignition on to activate the new fuel pump. And you don't absolutely have to do this, but you'll notice what I'm doing is I'm burping the system of air. It just makes the first startup a little bit easier. And once there's no more air coming out, then you can remove the hose and you can screw the cap back onto the fuel rail. And with the engine idling, the new pump is giving us just over 50 PSI, which is good. And you'll notice with a slight rev, it doesn't lose fuel pressure. And now that we know everything works, we can put the hatch covers on and tighten down the 10 millimeter nuts that hold those in place. We can lower the carpet, tuck the corners of the carpet back under the trim pieces. And when you lower the carpet, there's a couple little tabs that have to be tucked in. And now with the magic of video, we can put all the trim pieces back on in about 20 seconds. And I just wanna say that some fuel spills on the interior, it's pretty much unavoidable so I just left the windows down and let the car air out for a couple of days. Out on the road it became clear that between the filter and the pump this problem had been going on for at least the two years that I owned the vehicle. I was seeing performance that I had never seen in the vehicle before. Makes sense since the substantial increase in fuel pressure at the injector gives a more efficient spray, better combustion. It improved not only the power, but the fuel economy went up. So this was a very effective repair. If this helped you guys out, please give a thumbs up, subscribe for future videos, and to help out anybody else trying to replace one of these, please do share this video. Thanks for watching.